very much for, uh, for everyone attending here in person and online. My name is Bushra and I'll be presenting our paper titled 99% False Positive, a qualitative study of SOC analyst perspectives on security alarms. So the focus of our study is security operation centers, which are the first line of defense in any organization. So there are the centralized unit that provide the monitoring capabilities um, that are they're responsible for the detection of cyber security threats in any organization. And in order to achieve that, they use various technologies. So probably one of the most important one is the SIM, which is a technology in the SOC that basically pulls all the alerts from all the security tools uh, deployed in the organization, whether it's intrusion detection systems, network monitoring, antivirus, and so on logs all pulled into the SIM and then analyzed to produce an alarm when there is a detection of a threat. And of course, the humans or the SOC analysts, they are the ones responsible to deal with these alarms. And it's no secret that um, analysts themselves are basically overwhelmed. So they receive a high volume of alarms and they are tasked to determine the validity of these alarms which of these alarms are actually uh, actual incidents, threats that they have to take action, and which of these are false positive. And of course, the majority of these alarms turn out to be false positive. And of course, if you deal this volume uh, with this volume of alar uh, alarms, this can lead to human error, fatigue, and burnout, which has been looked at in previous research. As well, it will lead to alarm desensitization, mistrust, and lack of, lack of human responsiveness. So basically, the, uh, it reaches a point where the analyst will kind of ignore these alarms, um, which is a challenge. So in our research, we set out to investigate alarms in SOCs to understand how SOC analysts review these alarms and how can we improve the quality of these alarms. And of course, we, uh, for such a, a, a research, it's important to ask SOC analyst perspectives on the alarms in order to learn from the challenges they face in their everyday tasks. So let's move on to the methods. And since our security operation centers in any organization, they have distinct setups and goals, and therefore the people, technology, and processes would be unique as well. For this reason, we followed an inductive approach. So we started with a quantitative study uh, as a starting point for our qualitative research. So we started going through the literature on SOC, intrusion detection systems, in order to design our survey. Then we conducted a survey with, 21, uh, with 20 participants, and the goal of the survey was to identify areas that we need to focus on in our qualitative research. We then conducted semi-structured interviews with around 21 analysts that work across seven different SOCs. And since the survey was not intended to identify statistical significance, uh, instead it was used to focus our semi-structured interviews. Uh, therefore, in this talk, we'll focus the discussion of the results on the results of our qualitative study, but details of the qualitative, uh, quantitative study are in the paper as well. So based on the findings from our quantitative study, we identified the following research questions for our qualitative study. So these are the research questions. How do SOC analysts distinguish true alarms from false, false alarms? What do analysts perceive to be a false positive, and how can we establish a more precise definition? What are the limitations of alarms produced by existing SOC tools, and how can we design better tools to improve the alarm's quality and filtering of false positives? So starting with the first research question, uh, during our interview, our uh, analysis of our qualitative data, we, uh, it revealed similar process across all SOCs uh, in terms of how they perform alarm validation. So usually they'll have the SIM that takes all the data and then presents an alarm to the SOC analyst, and it's up to the analyst to determine if this is a true alarm, meaning there's an actual attack happening that they have to take action, or is this a false positive, meaning that it's a false alarm? And this process we will call alarm validation. And determining if this alarm is actually a result of an actual threat basically comes down to uh, the SOC analyst. So there is a huge 
reliance on the SOC analyst to perform this job. So based on the inputs the analyst is getting from all of these different security technologies, they use their cognitive ability to look and pattern, rec uh, uh, rec uh, pattern matching and other uh, cognitive abilities in order to determine if this is a true alarm or a false positive. As stated by one of our participants, I think that's where the human element still remains because even if you get an alert, the alert will have to be sent to the human to make the intelligent de decision. And similar to any kind of decision-making process, the analyst would uh, have many um, factors that influence how they make the decision. And we narrowed down to multiple uh, categories, such as the type of client, are we monitoring for a government versus non-government, the type of SOC they work, is it an internal SOC or is it a managed security service uh, provider, as well as the knowledge that they have accumulated uh, through their experience of the monitored environment. And each of these factors have many challenges within as well. For example, if uh, an analyst works in government, they would have to have certain security clearance to access certain information that they need to validate the alarms. So in most cases, they wouldn't have that security clearance, so they would have areas that is not clear to them. As well as analysts who work in secur uh, managed security service providers, they, in addition to their daily job, they also have pressures that come from dealing with clients, pressures of fines, pressures of actually have to deliver and uh, communicate alerts as soon as possible. But at the same time, they fear that they would look inadequate if they reported an alarm and it turns out to be a false positive. As well as the knowledge, whether it's tacit knowledge or even knowledge of the environment. And as one of the participants says, the more the client shares, the better of a job we can do. So all of these are factors that kind of impact the alarm validation and influence how the SOC analysts determine if this is a true alarm or a false positive. And as you can see, there's a lot of inputs, uh, inputs to the SOC analysts, and it's really a human cognitive effort to determine uh, the validity of the alarm. So moving on to our second research question, what do SOC analysts perceive to be a false positive, and how can we establish a more precise definition? So one of our participants stated, and I think we hear this a lot, we know that 99% of the alarms we generate are false positives, but we have to look at them. So high percentage of the generated alarms in a SOC are considered false positive, meaning that they are not a true attack. But what does that mean for us? Does that mean that the detection technology itself is flawed, meaning all the security tools that we are designing are not performing their job? And this is what we set out in our research to kind of investigate further. So usually in security, we have kind of two types of alarm. True alarms, which are alarms generated as a result of an actual security threat, as well as false positive, meaning a false alarm. But as one of our participants stated, if an alarm was produced by a security tool, but the customer is aware of them and its origin, but chooses to ignore it for a business reason, should this be classified as a false positive? And we've seen a multiple of these uh, uh, statements from our participants when we asked them about the, adequate, uh, about the accuracy of the security tools they use. And when we asked them about the 99% false positives that they keep reporting. Uh, so for example, one of the participants said that uh, snort signatures are noisy, well, I say they're noisy, because they're, but they're actually doing what they should do. They're always identifying vulnerable versions of Java, but a lot of companies have a lot of vulnerable versions of Java, so we, uh, uh, so we get a massive influx of it. So they know there is an issue, but they just ignore it because there is a business reason why, for example, some organization wouldn't patch or wouldn't upgrade their Java versions. So such alarms, which are true alarms that match an existing signature, but the organization chooses to ignore it for a business justified purpose, are participant called benign triggers. So what are benign triggers? That means that the condition is, per uh, is perfectly matched and the filter as such works, but the circumstances are completely legitimate. This is benign because the purpose is business justified and is not malicious. So benign triggers represent a high percentage of the alarms, 
And therefore, we should be uh, careful when we use terms such as false positive, because it kind of gives the impression that the technology itself is flawed, which is not always the case. So we should choose, uh, use that kind of distinction between alarms and security. So we have the true alarms, which are actually threats. False positive means that the technology itself is not detecting the threat, so it might need tuning and improvement. But also there is the benign triggers that is a business justified exception for that specific client uh, that we, um, and we should label these uh, alarms uh, uh, within these three kind of categorizations. For our third research questions on the limitations of alarms produced by existing SOC tools, we actually, uh, in the paper, we detail the strengths and weaknesses that the participants uh, listed for uh, intrusion detection tools or even SIMs. But we can kind of distill these in three main categories that are related to alarm reliability and customizability, alarm explainability, and contextuality. In brief, uh, the issues highlighted in security tools that are impacting the alarm liability are for example, signatures that rely on features that change. For example, signatures that use domain names. Signatures written to deal with new threats quickly. Um, for example, if there's a, a, a new threat, they, the analysts quickly write the signature, and they deploy it, and they don't review it later on to tune it and so on. Also, signatures loosely or too broadly written to cover multiple attacks, and that lead to a, a lot of um, uh, uh, low-quality alarms. So one of the examples one of our participating SOC mentioned is that they received a lot of uh, alarms for SQL injections for one of the clients. And when they explored, they found that the signature was actually looking for words like select or drop table. And when they investigated, they found that the client actually is selling a product called drop table. So it's like a foldable table. So every time a, someone actually buys this drop table, an alarm is, goes to the SOC. So they can't actually disable this alarm because there is other clients, for example, that might uh, use this signature, but uh, this is actually an example of something called a benign trigger. Also, alarm explainability. So uh, analysts do not know why the alarm was fired. There's no description. Uh, and this kind of ambiguity leads to no action. So the, uh, so the analysts do not um, uh, have high respect or trust to these technologies that provide such alarms. As well as alarm contextuality, including context into alarm is important. For example, the customer business, the knowledge of external uh, sources, and so on. So how can we design better security tools? From what we've learned, from our uh, study about unreliable alarms, lack of explainability, customizability, we introduced the React model. So these are properties that uh, we should consider when we design tools. Reliable, explainable, analytical, contextual, and transferable. And we also discuss in this paper how we can utilize machine learning to achieve these goals, either through AI, human collaboration, explainable AI, knowledge graph, and so on. And all of these are detailed in this paper. And with that, I conclude my talk. Thank you, everyone, for listening and for my collaborators. And happy to answer any questions now or email or Slack or Twitter. Thank you.